Uh, a very warm welcome to the first Ibib Sign Webinar for 2022. Uh, my name is Anna Mohoriani. I am an associate professor in sustainable building and urban design at the Institute for Environmental Design and Engineering. We are part of the Bartlett the Faculty of the Building Environment at University College London. I am also the co-secretary of IBIPSA England. Uh, IBIPSA England is an affiliate of the International Building Performance Simulation Association, IBIPSA World, uh, which is a non-profit international society of building performance simulation researchers, developers, and practitioners who are dedicated to improving the built environment. A key aim of IBIPSA England is to advance and promote the science of building performance simulation. Uh, in order to improve the design, construction, operation, and maintenance of both new and existing buildings. Uh, anyone with an interest in building performance simulation can join us and become an individual member of IBIPSA England. And uh, Rokaya, if that's okay with you, my, my colleague and co-secretary of IBIPSA England, Rokaya Raslan, will provide some more information about how you can join us as a member. Uh, thank you, Anna. We currently have over 200, uh, 200 active members, uh, both here in the UK, but also around the world. So if you're interested in becoming either an individual member or a corporate member, I've posted the link in the chat to our website where there is a membership form that you can fill in or an email where you can contact us um, in terms of uh, discussing your interest in becoming a member of IBIPSA England. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much, Rukaya. Um, so in today's event, we have invited three excellent speakers uh, who will offer perspectives from academia and the industry to help us explore the role of building performance simulation towards climate resilient building design beyond COP26. Um, so as we all know, climate change will have significant impacts on the building environment. Uh, for example, according to current projections, we expect to see an increase in the frequency and magnitude of events such as heat waves, floods and droughts. Um, most buildings around the world have been designed with a different fixed climate in mind. And this means that in the future or even now, they might not be able to cope with a warming climate. Uh, at the same time, climate change adaptation needs to be combined with actions to meet the very urgent net zero targets that we have set for the building sector. I do believe that building performance simulation can be a very powerful tool uh, that can help us predict future building performance um, and associated indoor environmental exposure risks and energy consumption and carbon emissions. Um, so in this webinar, we will look at some of those emerging methods, tools and data sets that we could use for this purpose. Um, so I'm really looking forward to uh, both the talks and the discussion. Uh, so just to say, we will take questions after the end of the last presentation, uh, but please feel free to put any questions you might have in the Q&A area as we, as we go along. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to our first speaker, uh, Dr. Anastasia Milona from SIPSI. Anastasia, I don't know if you can share your screen. Uh, so Anastasia is a head of research at the Charter Institution of Building Services Engineers, uh, supervising the SIPSI funding research portfolio towards developing new knowledge for SIPSI members. In this role, Anastasia leads the development of SIPSI guidance, which is relevant to climate change impacts and adaptation, and the climate change information required for the future proofing of buildings and their services, with the ethos of translating research into industry and practice. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, the, to your presentation. Over to you, Anastasia. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to speak today um, at the webinar. Um, Anna asked me to say a couple of words regarding COP26. Um, and the way I see it is that um, is, is lacking um, urgency, which means for me that um, we will need to be able to adapt at least um, until the, the middle of this century um, because we have already committed to a, a certain amount of um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, and, and to whatever changes in climate will happen until the middle of the century, hoping that any changes that we will make and any reductions in um, the emissions will have significant effect um, and stabilize our climate after the middle of the of the century. So um, I will talk a little bit about the 
um, UK climate projections, UK CP18. They were launched in um, November 2018 and they provide quite a lot of um, different types of information and, and products. Um, it gives, it highlights um, certain key messages. For example, it produces um, messages like the 2018, for example, uh, summer was quite a hot one. And if we look at the projections in the future, while this was uh, a 10% probability to happen, the, um, towards the middle of the century, we're looking at one in two summers, um, we will experience this kind of hot event and that will become even more um, often towards the end of the century. The projections also uh, provide useful maps that look at the different um, warming in the UK. For example, for, uh, from these maps, you can see that we are actually getting warmer, um, hotter summers, um, hotter and, and um, the, the, the hotter the, the, the summers will be towards the southeast where you can see the really dark red um, while the, the warming will be perhaps less so in, in the north. Um, so to go into the weather files that we have available, um, they are based on the previous um, climate projections and they are um, hourly weather files that they are currently using used in, in simulation quite a lot. They're only available for 14 UK locations due to the methods that we are using to, to produce them, that they are relying on Met Office data uh, and a complete data set. Um, we have them available for three time periods, uh, 2020s, 2050s and 2080s, and for three um, emission scenarios. I will concentrate a little bit on the design summer years, which are specifically for overheating analysis. Um, and they are available for three, um, they, they are available, three design summer years are available per location um, that they are characteristic of three different hot events. The design summer year one, two, and three, moderately warm summer, short intense warm spell and longer intense, uh, less intense warm spell. And we have more um, locations for London because of the urban heat island effect. And all these design summer years are available for the um, future climate projections as highlighted in, in, in this slide. Um, very usefully, the Met Office has produced um, these slides, this couple of slides where um, it provides the relevance between the two degrees global temperature change and the four degrees global temperature change in relation to the, um, the SIPSI future weather files. And you can see, I don't know if you can see my cursor, you can see that uh, the most relevant to the two degrees global temperature change is the, the B1 scenario, emission scenario, which is a low uh, 50th percentile uh, for the 2020s. Um, and, and equally, the four um, degrees global temperature is um, the equivalent to the high emissions 50th probability 28, 2080s um, weather file, um, both of them the design summer years. Um, SIPSI also um, produced these pro clips, the probabilistic climate projections, just to um, highlight the uncertainty that is associated with each of the emission scenarios and the, um, and the projections. Uh, and this is just an example where um, it summarizes the summer mean daily temperature. You can see, for example, that in the 2020s, the uncertainty is relatively small. Um, there isn't much difference between the low, high, low, medium and high emission scenarios. So, you know, um, 
the, there isn't the need to look at the full scope of probabilistic um, scenarios and, and weather files. But as you go towards the end of the century, you can see that there's quite a lot of difference uh, between the low, medium and high based on the, um, the greenhouse gas emissions that we have released in the atmosphere. And there is quite a, a big range of uncertainty. So what we are trying to tell designers that the further into the future you're looking, the more the, the files you need to, to look at, the, the, the bigger the, um, the um, range, the, the range of, of probabilities that you should be looking into. Um, this is um, a publication um, that we have released a few years ago um, with the aim to, um, to provide a consistent methodology in assessing overheating, especially in homes. Um, you need to use dynamic thermal modeling to follow this methodology. And it's the first time that we are introducing the use of the future design summer year as a standard, as a minimum requirement. Um, following the publication of TM59, it has been uh, adopted by various um, national and local re regulatory and, and policy um, documents. This is the most recent one, which is the new um, approved document O, which is looking at overheating in, in new uh, buildings, new uh, domestic buildings in England. And it has two different methods of compliance. One is the simplified method. Um, and the alternative is a dynamic method, which is uh, suggesting the use of TM59. Um, and as a result, again, is um, looking to uh, implement and, and use the um, future design summer year. So again, we are looking, we are seeing that the industry and policy slowly um, adopting the idea of adaptation. Um, the London plan also has the requirement to use TM59 methodology in domestic, new domestic developments. Um, and also the Department for Education, BB101 standard, um, has the requirement to use the 2020s design summer year um, when you are looking at the um, performance of, of new schools. So um, what are future plans? Um, we are currently in the process of updating uh, the weather files based on the new projections. Um, the things that are, are useful and, and we are going to be looking into is the, um, the 2.2 kilometer projections. And we are going to look into producing more than the 14 locations that we have at the moment. So we are hoping to have um, quite a lot more based on the, the data availability. And also, um, very interesting, we have the global projections that we will look into potentially long, longer term, provide um, international locations as well as UK locations. And of course, we're going to look at the full range of products um, when we are looking at, at this uh, revision. So as I said, um, we are going to look at the resources available to us um, in the new projections with a focus to provide more locations, um, both UK, but also globally. Um, the other aim is to better represent climate risk in the assessment of buildings and their resilience um, and look to produce perhaps less less weather files, so reduce the simulation requirement. Um, and also we are going to look at better representation of extremes. Thank you very much.
That's great. Thank you so much, Anastasia. And I'm really looking forward to those UGCP18 based weather files. Um, so just to remind our audience, if you have any questions for any of our speakers, please do put your questions in the Q&A area and we'll try to answer them, time permitting, at the end. Um, so uh, I would now like to move to our next speaker, uh, Professor Shady Atia from the University of Liège. Um, so Shady, if you could please uh, start sharing your screen. Um, so, Professor Ade is an architecture engineer and professor in sustainable architecture and building technology at the University of Liège in Belgium. Uh, he has expertise in building physics, performance simulation optimization, and post occupancy evaluation. His research is focused on informed decision support for a range of domains, from the design of user center and carbon neutral buildings to the evaluation of the indoor outdoor environmental quality. So over to you, Shady. Thank you, Anna, for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to start with the, the title of the presentation, which is a simulation based framework to evaluate. Uh, resistivity of cooling strategies in building under climate change conditions. And I'm very delighted to be invited by IBIPSA England. To be honest, my number one community is IBIPSA World, and I'm benefiting from all these small <laughs> IBIPSA families all over the world uh, because yeah. it gives a very uh, clear um, uh, ways on how to tackle uh, the challenges related to the built environment and with buildings. And in this sense, I'm associated, I'm a member of IBIPSA Netherlands and Flanders. We don't have an IBIPSA in the French speaking Belgium, but I'm associated with the Dutch speaking uh, IBIPSA. And for sure, I'm also a member of IBIPSA World. Now, I need to acknowledge very fast the IEA uh, Annex 80 members, all of them, and uh, my uh, team members of the project occupant that we have here in Belgium, because behind this simulation framework that I'm going to talk about, uh, that is mainly related to building performance simulation. All those people are contributing, and I cannot name them. So I just need to make sure that I'm not talking here in my name. I'm, I'm talking in the name of a big group of people. We're working since two years around this topic. So as you know, the latest publication of IPC, IPCC that was published last year, end of 2021, there is a new uh, IPCC report and there is new scenarios that are worse than the scenarios from the report of 2016. And as you see in this graph, the most recurring events in the near future will be mainly uh, extreme heat and uh, mean air temperature increase and even fires. And fires is the threat number one in Europe. And especially if we are in the northwest of Europe, all of us, we have a lot of greenery around us. We have a lot of forest. Uh, the, the challenge that we see in south of Europe uh, related to Portugal and Spain, we have to foresee it. And therefore, air quality and association with a temperature increase will be the threat number one. Uh, uh, climate change will not wait for us until we take the correct measures. Uh, in this context, uh, in our Annex 80, we wanted to define resilience and we needed to be more specific. We wanted to define the resilience of cooling characteristics and the risk factor around uh, the overheating risks in buildings. And after a long of work of investigation, we collaborated with the United Nations, we collaborated with, with the United States Green Building Council Rally Rating System on Resilience and the definition of resilience. We had to distinguish uh, four stages related to the term uh, uh, resilience, mainly the vulnerability phase, the resistant phase for a building, uh, the robustness and finally recovery and as you can see robustness entails failure so the key message i want to talk about with you today is that when we talk resilience we must have a shock we must have a disruption and we must have a failure without failure and bouncing back after a failure we cannot name the building resilient and that's what we are trying to investigate in the ia annex we are even investigating the events and the shocks that can cause a building to fail. And since we are concerned with comfort, like what we saw with the heat dome in the Northwest, uh, uh, North, uh, in the North American, in the contact of North America, uh, in the West uh, with Vancouver and what happened last summer, that's kind of events that we are talking about. So in this context, in the annex, we started to uh, try to uh, define some uh, thermal condition, design thermal condition and uh, juxtapose them against uh, minimum thermal condition and critical thermal condition and failure conditions uh, with different future weather files, short waves, heat waves, 
200 end of the century, mid of the century scenarios uh, to make sure that we can test our solutions and our sizing of our cooling technologies, whether they are passive or active. And in this sense, we are looking at uh, resilient cooling characteristics uh, related to the overheating exposure risk, uh, the exposure severity, the ability to uh, adjust uh, to this exposure, and for sure the ability to recover or bounce back after we were hit, for example, with uh, a long heat wave or an extreme heat wave. And for sure, in our approach, we are coupling heat waves with power outage, because it will not be surprised surprised that when uh, there will be a heat wave, most probably we'll have power outages. The third parameter we did not address, which is fires, uh, but it seems that the extreme events uh, around the world occurring in the recent uh, years are confirming that heat, heat waves will be coupled with power outages and fires. So it's very important to learn what happened in Australia two years ago. So in this context, we are looking at these factors and we are trying to define some uh, frameworks that can allow us to make run simulations that take into account these multiple criteria, whether we are taking time on the short term, a very short heat wave or a hundred year long uh, uh, scenario. Uh, the scale can start with a single zone where you are grouping all occupants in one safe or refuge space in the building where you are providing cooling, or if you are talking about the whole system, HVAC system, the building as a whole, the neighborhood, the district, up to the city scale. And for sure, we are taking into account uh, the, the vulnerability to different shocks like heat wave, power outage, air pollution uh, by fire, and so on. So this is overall the frame that we are operating in. And what I would like to share with you, maybe I'm sorry, the presentation is very bit fast, but uh, I want to share the maximum. And this is a recorded event, so you can later come back to the slides. So far, we managed uh, to publish in the IEA Annex 80 uh, a framework to evaluate the, re the resilience of different cooling uh, technologies. And this framework is based on uh, simple use of um, future weather files and the exclusion or inclusion of urban heat island effect. And based on that, we try to find a, or develop a framework that can cater for the whole world. So when we mapped our work, we looked at all uh, the, the planet so that the framework can be used worldwide in different uh, cities. And as you can see here, we have different representation of cities. Then becomes the, in this framework, you need to define the building characteristic that will be used, whether you are using a shoebox uh, approach representing the building in a multi-zone or simply the best test series 610, 600, 620, or if you have a real case studies that you have really monitored data and you wanna represent uh, in the model. So as you can see, we referred mainly to ASHRAE 169 because it's the most accurate, it's based on cooling and heating degree days, representing a very accurate climatic uh, characteristic of, of the world. And from there, the framework goes with the next step with defining the archetype or simply the architecture uh, uh, archetype or the representation of the building, whether it's an ideal building model like the best test or it's a theoretical model uh, made by experts like we see a lot of benchmarks published. There is an European database, there is an uh, American database. And for sure, uh, the last option can be a real case study where you are using for running the simulation and testing your cooling technology and comparing them to check how severe will be a heat wave or future climate change. Uh, after moving from the archetypes, uh, we used one, uh, actually 189.1 2017 because we had a difficulty to use the passive house standards. It was not uh, appealing to use it all over the world. We found actually 189.1 one more appealing because it defines high performance building all over the world using the ashy climatic zones. So you can have it from Alaska till Madagascar. And this allows to have a more uh, accurate representation regarding the characteristics from the envelope regarding air tightness, uh, heat transmittance, and so on. And uh, this is uh, backing back again, like a summary of the first part of the framework. The second part of framework, we are talking here about the comfort model that will be, be, will be used and the cooling technology that you want to check in order to assure comfort and make sure that people can survive during extreme events. So far, we in the annex working on fully air conditioned buildings and free running buildings. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we were unable to have a common international consensus on how to evaluate mixed mode 
or hybrid running buildings, because this is still an issue that is not uh, having an international agreement. And we are fluctuating between ISO standards, EN standards. We are even working sometimes with TM59 in the UK, very interesting standard. And while all the work of SIPSI is very, very good, uh, but we are between ASHRAE, uh, SEN standards, and for sure ISO uh, 17772 in the two parts are our reference. Uh, so far, just to give you a glimpse, we are using a very interesting indicator, which is called the severity uh, uh, indicator or the ambient warmness degree uh, indicator, which evaluates the severity of the outdoor warmness by averaging the cooling degree hours calculated for the base temperature. For sure, the base temperature can be, can be varied. And based on that, we can uh, estimate the ambient uh, warmness degree. And another important ind indicator we are using also, it's called the indoor overheating degree, which is developed of one of our members of the Annex. Uh, Hamdi, and in this index, we can uh, uh, introduce different thermal comfort limits for different zones. So it can allow for a multi-zonal approach. And then you can distinguish the sleeping room, for example, compared to the living area. And you can put more uh, uh, stringent requirements or thresholds regarding your comfort requirement in regard to the occupancy and the expectation of comfort. So this moves, we move after that uh, to this classification of the cooling technologies that we are trying to test in the Annex. And as you can see in the Annex, we are working mainly on four families of cooling technologies, uh, technologies uh, that are reducing externally uh, uh, the heat gains, uh, technology that remove sensible uh, heat from indoor environment, and category C, uh, personal comfort uh, technology or systems that can be in the same zone integrated. And finally, technology that can remove uh, humidity or latent heat uh, in the indoor environment. Um, well, I'm coming to an end. Um, I want to respect the 10 minutes limit. But uh, if you ask me in a short word, what is beyond the uh, uh, COP26, the next COP26 COP is uh, will be in my origin country, Egypt. Uh, in Sharm Sheikh. Um, well, it is to prepare for climate change while living under the condition of climate change, because climate change, like I told in the beginning, it will not wait for us. So we need today to live with overheating problems and events, talk about how we will have environmental friendly refrigerants, uh, how can we tackle heat waves, uh, can we run mixed mode operation of buildings, but with a standardized approach that will not jeopardize the comfort condition of people and not also uh, 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 abundantly use energy and resources to just space condition the building. And for sure, low uh, impact cooling will be a necessity to fight uh, climate change and assure uh, the resilience in the coming years. I share with you those two uh, publications just as samples, but I invite you to look at our website of the IEA Annex. And for that, I thank you and I hope you can share uh, or interact through uh, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shady. Really fascinating and ambitious work. And again, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, so I can see some questions coming in the Q&A, so please keep posting them and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end. Um, so last but not least, um, our third speaker is Dr. Jonathan Taylor from Tampere University. Uh, Jonathan, if you could try sharing your screen. Um, so uh, Dr. Taylor is an associate professor in urban physics in the Department of Civil Engineering at Tampere University in Finland. He has a bachelor's degree in biological sciences from Simon Fraser University in Canada and a bachelor's degree in geomatic engineering and PhD in environmental building science uh, both from University College London, uh, where I had the pleasure to be his colleague for, for many years before he joined Tampere University. Um, John's research interests are in healthy and energy efficient housing, combining building physics and geographic information systems to evaluate population level exposure to various indoor environmental health hazards. He currently researches indoor air quality, disease transmission risks, indoor heat and cold exposures and moisture in the built environment, climate change and housing adaptation, and informal housing in the global south. Over to you, John. Thank you very much, and thank you for, for having me. Um, so I'm going to be talking about modeling housing resilience and to climate hazards. Um, Right, so Anna did a really good job of introducing sort of my background and, and, and what I study, but I'm gonna talk really briefly about where I'm from, as Shadi mentioned. Um, 
Vancouver experienced some, some really terrible temperatures this past summer, as you can see in the top left. I'm originally from there and my family still lives there. Um, as part of those high temperatures, there were forest fires all over British Columbia. And in the bottom left, you can see the town of Lytton. At the time of that fire, uh, my parents were one hour drives north at our summer cottage. Uh, my 99 year old grandmother was uh, <clears throat> in her nursing home in Vancouver, where it was nearly 50 degrees Celsius, but they couldn't open the windows because of the, uh, the smoke from the fires. The same year recently, they had massive floods everywhere. And just a couple of weeks ago, they had a big winter storm, which damaged some of the infrastructure, which you can see on the bottom right. So the point is climate change isn't some nebulous thing in the future, it's actually happening right now. And for many of us, it's a really personal thing. Uh, in the UK, climate change is going to lead to things, an increased frequency of certain climate hazards. And these will include in the UK heat waves and extreme temperatures and flooding and heavy rain. An individual's exposure to that climate hazard is going to depend on where they're lo located, where they live, where their houses are. And our houses are meant to provide some kind of shelter or buildings are meant to provide shelter from the elements. And so, again, their exposure is going to be dependent on the ability of their home or the building that they're occupying to protect against or perhaps make this exposure even worse. The person's vulnerability to a climate hazard is going to depend on a number of factors, for example, their, their health, their income and their age. So if we're talking about building resilience and reducing risk, we have to take into account these three elements, hazard, exposure and vulnerability. Now, reducing risk therefore requires mitigating the hazard. And in this case, we have to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions substantially over the next few years. Uh, we're gonna have to reduce the exposure by adapting our built environment. And for example, that's gonna be involved adapting our outdoor built environment surrounding us. For example, urban greening to, to reduce temperatures and help with flood runoff. Uh, building new flood defenses, but there's also going to be a really important element that means adapting housing to be more resilient to these hazards. And we also have to provide support for the to reduce the vulnerability of certain groups, because we know that some groups are going to be far more vulnerable to certain hazards than other groups. So to talk briefly about some of the work that we've done looking at these hazards, one of the hazards is flooding in London. And the aim of this work was to identify where the risk uh, for prolonged damp was the greatest following a flood in London. So to do this, we have flood maps and flood maps are widely available, developed by um, DEFRA, for example, which would show the acute, acute exposure uh, to floods of certain depths across London. So we know where it would flood to a certain depth given a 1 in 100, 1 in 500, 1 in 1,000 year scenario. Uh, we also use built a hydrothermal building physics model and mold growth model to estimate how long certain buildings would remain damp if they got flooded in different housing archetypes. And we were able to locate those archetypes on a map. So to identify the areas that would be flooded and where the houses would remain damp for an extended period of time. And then we were able to overlay that on top of both sort of into a map, but also overlay it with the vulnerability of populations. For example, they've got a, a social vulnerability to flood index. Another hazard is heat waves in London. Here, the aim was to identify where the risk of heat mortality is greatest during the hot weather. Again, we could look at the, the spatial variation of the hazard. In this case, we have urban climate models, um, urban heat island temperatures we used here, but we can also project it to the future using future climate files. Again, we use building physics, in this, time, uh, in this case, Energy Plus. And uh, we used to, to estimate the corresponding indoor temperature exposures for individual houses around London. And we used uh, the information from the EPC certificate re register to find out the characteristics of houses. And then we're able to overlay it on top of, you know, know where these houses are, know what the outdoor temperatures are, and then know where the vulnerable populations are. And in this case, we use the age of the population, the average age, or the dis different age distribution of the population within these areas to, to assess some, get some idea, uh, proxy of the vulnerability of the population. 
another study that looked at heat was looking at heat waves in the West Midlands, and this aimed to identify how different adaptations to housing could reduce the heat risk. We used actually the SIBSI weather files to look at future um, weather scenarios. And then we used, again, the building physics model um, derived from energy plus simulations to estimate corresponding indoor temperatures for a representative sample of buildings in the West Midlands as informed by the English Housing Survey. Now, the advantage of the English Housing Survey is that we know both the information on the dwelling, but also information on the occupants. So in this case, we were again able to take the age of the occupant as being a proxy for vulnerability and use that to estimate the risk of heat-related mortality using a heat health relationship. And in this case in particular, we looked at the use of certain adaptations like insulation, um, external shutters, uh, different window opening behaviors, or greening, for example, of the, the urban heat island. So to summarize a bit, I think building simulation is a really valuable tool to be able to understand the climate risk, including understanding the effectiveness of retrofits to reduce energy consumption, greenhouse gas emissions, and mitigate climate change. And I think building modelers, for example, from um, IBIPSA, have a really important role to play in doing that. It's also really useful to do some of the stuff that I do, where you're identifying the housing variants that might be at increased risk of exposure to a climate hazard and identifying suitable adaptations, which might be able to reduce the indoor exposure to that hazard. However, I do think there's a, a human element and we need to improve resilience by also a, accounting for differential vulnerabilities. And I don't think we're very good at doing that in the building simulation community. For example, we've talked about the extreme weather files, the DSYs, and there's heat wave files, and, and so on and so forth. We're very good at looking at extreme weather scenarios, but why are we not looking at extreme occupancy scenarios where you'll have vulnerable individuals and they might not be able to use their buildings in the same way that the standard assumptions and modeling assumptions might dictate. So I think that's something we need to do, do more of. In terms of reflecting on COP26, um, I think it's a step in the right direction, but it doesn't really go far enough. I think that's the, a fairly common consensus. We obviously need to accelerate mitigation and includes increased energy efficiency through retrofit and cleaner energy. Um, I think it's a very difficult task to retrofit the UK building stock because it's so old and there are unintended consequences of not doing it correctly. And I think there's a skills gap there. So this is very easily promised, but incredibly complex to do in reality and, and talk is cheap. I think change is inevitable. So while COP doesn't go far enough, we need to start adapting our housing right, and buildings right away. We need to talk about equity. So there's a disconnect right now in the UK between the energy consumption and climate exposure of the wealthiest individuals and those of the poorest. So if we adapt and mitigate, can it be done in a fair and equitable way? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jonathan, especially for those last reflections on, on COP26. And um, I was specifically interested to hear about your thoughts on testing extreme um, occupants and occupancy scenarios, because I think we tend to focus a lot on optimizing the building fabric, but we sometimes forget about the people who inhabit those, those buildings. Um, so thank you, um, th thanks to all of you for those great presentations. So if that's okay with everyone, we can move on to some questions. I can see the, the questions coming in, in the Q&A. So I have a few questions uh, for Anastasia. Um, so our first question is, I think that the time periods used in the SIPSI weather files misrepresent the problem because people assume that the 28 weather files will occur in 2080. Um, in fact, there is some evidence that it is already happening. Anchoring into a point in the future reinforce, reinforces a lack of urgency. And this is uh, something that frustrates me often because we it's it's a time slice, but sometimes we, we, we spell it 2080. 20, yeah, yeah. so, mm -hmm. um, but I think there is a, there's a a broader point there about how that lack of urgency that it still looks like something far away in the future. So yeah, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, Anastasia. Um, I mean, two the two elements in this um, in this question. One is um, the twenty eighties versus twenty eighty. 
um, I get a lot of questions uh, or, or papers to review that, that mention 2080, and it's absolutely mm -hmm. not 2080, yes. it's the 30 year climate. We cannot give projections for a specific year. Um, and everywhere in the CPC uh, guidance, it's always very clear that it's a yeah, 30, 30 year climate projection for the 2080s. Um, the, 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 the second point is, is a good point because indeed, um, as I showed in my first slide, um, the 20, for example, the 2018 summer might be something, so we, is, is uh, like us having experienced the 2080s mm -hmm. because we are going to experience this, this type of climate much more often. Um, perhaps every summer will be like that and we don't even know what the extreme then would be. Um, so that's, that's, a very, that's a very good point and perhaps it's something to incorporate when we are looking into representation of extremes be much more specific as to we have actually experienced how the climate will be towards the end of the century is not something that we have no idea and when we haven't experienced and I think the same goes with flooding as well. Mm. Yeah so I think a lot of this has to do with how we communicate risk and, and projections so um, yes come and call it the 30-year climate projection or the 2080 projection um yeah i think a lot of this has to do with the with the language and the terminology yeah. uh, we use but the, these are complex concepts so communicating them can, mm -hmm. can be quite challenging mm -hmm. um so the next comment is thanks anastasia um, and a question at what distance from the ground level are the projections based on I think this is something to look into the um, the project the Met Office website. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I don't yeah. I don't want to say something wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but all the information is in the technical report. They have a lot of extensive information, so you can find exactly how um, the measurements were done. And um, yeah, Thanks. if you if you if you put in Google UK CP18, then you will take you to the to the right page. Yeah, there's a lot of detailed information. There is on the yes. website. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the next question from Phil Simmons, Anastasia, when might the new files be available? Do you know what inter international locations might be included? Uh, so the, the first thing we're going to produce is the UK locations, and I'm hoping we are going to have them out in about two years time. Um, just so that it gives us the opportunity to look at all the, the range of, um, of products and, and do all the analysis that, that um, is required. Um, of course, um, and this get, the, the idea came today from speaking to, to everybody. Um, we have a, a user group and we are going to be testing those weather files mm -hmm. for quite a long time before they're released. So um, it might, you know, the Ibiza group uh, community um, might be, um, you know, a, a community that we would like to kind of get volunteers to test the, the mm. weather files when, when we have something that we can share with them. Ah, mm. And the international location. So uh, as part of this kind of the next two years, we're going to look at um, what is available in terms of the global projections. Um, but this is going to be developed after we have developed the, the UK. Um, so it's a longer, longer term plan. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, uh, a question from Paul Truri. The weather files are selected based on outdoor air temperature. Is there any thought on including solar radiation or a combined metric like solar temperature? Um, we are going to look in, into that. Um, this time, because we, I think we have the time and the resources to look into that. Yes, the design summer years are selected based on, on temperature only. Um, and we are going to look at um, solar radiation, but also perhaps humidity. It will very much rely on um, sensitivity analysis that we do, but also the availability of, of data. Um, and uh, two more questions uh, for Anastasia before we move on uh, to the other question for John. And um, are there any plans to introduce urban heat island scenarios for cities other than London? So we did, um, when we did the previous generation of weather files, we did an analysis based on Manchester and Birmingham, and there wasn't a significant, uh, I'm sorry, um, 
I'm sure there is a significant urban heat island effect, but the data that we had, it wasn't centrally enough So from airports, so it didn't capture that um, that, that impact of the urban heat island effect. But um, we are going to look now at the projections and the 2.2 kilometer data. Um, so again, based on the data availability and what the analysis will tell us, we will definitely consider adding more um, files for urban centers mm -hmm. other than London. And one final question from Claire Brown. Uh, you mentioned about uh, increasing the weather file locations. How will you decide where this should be? Is it again data, uh, data availability that dictates um, the location selected? It will have to be a, a sensitivity analysis. So we are going to look at, for example, um, an area of 2.2 multiple 2.2 locations and see how much um, the, the, the projections vary mm -hmm. uh, and if it, if it is actually worth producing 2.2 kilometer or you know where mm -hmm. is it robust enough to to scale up um, is it 10 12 kilometers you know or, or more or less mm -hmm. so again it will be part of the of the research to look to do the sensitivity analysis mm -hmm. and, and decide what would be the resolution and then how many actual um, files will be produced. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a few questions now for Jonathan and, and Shady. Um, a question for John. Do you think, uh, from Paul Drury, uh, do you think the current thermal comfort base overheating standards are adequate to prevent detrimental impacts on occupant health? Yeah, uh, and that's a great question. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure I have a good answer for that. And so in some countries like Finland, where I am now, they use a static thermal comfort threshold mm -hmm. and they say the number of degree hours above that can't exceed, I think it's 150 hours. And that's the same for any kind of dwelling that you're in. And I don't think that's good enough. I, I don't think just a static assumption like that works so much. If you look at the adaptive thermal comfort models that are used in the UK, where you have the different sort of criteria for different kinds of occupants, I think that's a really good step in the right direction and it's something that we can do but we're kind of missing the link between these sort of indoor temperature criteria and actual health outcomes i think we need to move towards getting a, a actual health related metric that we can use to assess the, uh, the risk within a building because right yeah right now we, we don't really have that yeah, very good point. Um, another question from us at Safety Car. Thank you for all, all four great presentations. I have a question for Jonathan. I was wondering what are the approaches he suggests for incorporating occupancy in overheating simulations? And I guess this relates back to that point you made about testing extreme or unusual occupancy scenarios. Yeah, so I, I guess this sort of goes back to, to some work that Anna actually did uh, quite a few years ago, where she looked at the building archetypes in the UK and model different occupancy behaviors and found that occupant behavior has a massive sort of uh, component or sort of variance in a building's overheating risk. So you look at the, the occupant's ability to, to open the windows, for example, to ventilate the building during a hot day. Uh, if they can't open the windows, then the overheating risk um, increases quite substantially. So we can sort of make some assumptions in terms of and try and model ourselves these extreme oc occupancy behaviors. But right now, the kind of standards that exist and the standards are good and they're a step in the right direction, but, but maybe we also want to be looking at the co combination of extreme weather files for the, mo the people who need the protection the most, yeah. for example. Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, so um, from Laurie Ferguson, um, a question for John. Do you have any thoughts on how we can better account for the human element, for example, different occupant vulnerabilities in building simulation? I guess you have partly answered that. I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add specifically on vulnerabilities. Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think maybe, you know, we can... It's a combination of maybe bringing in more metrics to assess what mm -hmm. overheating risk is for different people and working on that, but also maybe a sort of thinking about within some of these, uh, these methods that we use to assess the overheating risk, perhaps we need to start also looking at a range of these behaviors just to know whether the building is going to be mm -hmm. um, resilient for everybody who might possibly live there. Mm -hmm. Thanks. 
Um, so a question uh, from Edward Murphy, both for Shady and Jonathan. Should we be thinking about design for mitigation of impacts of wildfire in the EU and the UK, introducing fire breaks in landscaping, etc.? At what point in time is this justified for us? I don't know if uh, uh, Shady or John, would you like to answer that? Go ahead. Bit, yeah, mm -hmm. I feel I'm, I'm, it's not my field, but uh, mm -hmm. all I can see that there is a very strong correlation between fire outbreaks, mm -hmm. uh, power outage, mm -hmm. uh, extreme air pollution condition, and the scenarios we saw that in some areas, uh, citizens had to stay three or four days on oxygen masks to survive uh, the post-fire uh, trauma. Uh, with extreme heat and no electricity. So uh, I, unfortunately, uh, the debate, the scientific debate before COVID was trying to focus on the knowledge gap of mixed mode buildings. So like what Jonathan was saying, how can we look at a building that can be in a free running mode? Mm -hmm. But when we have uh, sensitive or vulnerable occupants, for example, during a specific season or a specific event, we can turn on air conditioners fully because then it's a life that we are saving and it makes sense. And then we can schedule or we can turn between this uh, um, fully space conditioned and then the free running mode. We don't have standard. The discussion before COVID was trying to go in this direction and to benefit from the adaptive thermal comfort models that exist with the static comfort models or the PMVPPD models that exist. And we were trying, to, there was some committee starting to go in the direction of a mixed mode. Unfortunately with COVID, all the attention went now to the ventilation and the air quality. Mm -hmm. So we got distracted by climate change mm -hmm. <laughs> itself. Mm -hmm. And that's what will happen in the coming years, that every time we will try to solve a problem, another one will appear. And we need to keep focus and need to keep track in parallel of the different mm -hmm. issues. Uh, and why I'm saying this, because simply this air quality issue is emerging again whether it is a transmission of disease or it is fire outbreak with a pollution in the outdoor and you cannot even use uh, the air from outside. So the complexity and the multiple criteria that come together uh, with the shock and then the scale, um, I, I think, yes, if there is a, a strategy for landscape design mm. or management of forest areas and to from now talk with the fire experts how to prepare barriers and corridors uh, 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 eco corridors even for animals because if you mm. see what happened in Australia a lot of animals will escape certain regions and there is no refuge for any of them and, and what I liked a lot in, 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 in Canada uh, that during this uh, heat dome there were centers that are named as refuge the city of Vancouver have 25 refuge and those refuges are fully air conditioned and they are inviting citizens who are vulnerable, whether they are children or elderly, to go in this refuge, because we will never be able to condition all buildings. Uh, we cannot make it. So I agree totally with Jonathan, and the idea is to uh, check for some refuge building. It can be public libraries. It can be in China, they do it in the underground, that you start to prepare in every city some kind of doom scenarios. Uh, that you can take, evacuate at least the most vulnerable population, provide them with a good comfort condition because we cannot do it with all buildings until we can have a transition to reverse uh, the, the, the climate change. But I agree again, air is coupled to comfort and coupled to occupancy for sure. Thank you so much, Shady. And I think there are probably lessons to be learned from science communication in relation to COVID and, and climate change. Um, so mindful of the time, but we have a few more questions to go through. So uh, thank you for posting both in the chat and the Q&A. Um, a, a question from Mama Akhtar Kaboni. Thank you all the speakers. I would like to ask something about the London plan. So I think that's for Anastasia. Are the summer years um, just considered for the assessment? What about other times in a year like future TMYs? as climate change also causes a paradigm shift in overall building energy and comfort performance? Um, so the question is, it requires the design summer year for the 2020s, whether it requires future... Whether also, yeah, TMYs are used. Um, I don't, I, um, I'm not sure, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, 
is definitely looking at mm -hmm. the use of uh, test reference years for energy um, use, but I don't know if it requires the future. Mm -hmm. I don't believe it does. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it only requires it for overheating assessment. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. But it's a good point. I mean, yes, um, it should. <laughs> Um, so I have a question for uh, uh, Shady. Uh, how did you identify the national representativeness of archetypes for building energy simulations? And how did you measure the effect size of the sample population for benchmarking? Okay, uh, I will forget the second question because yeah. I, I will focus <laughs> on the first one. Yeah, yeah please. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, uh, we had a debate uh, between the uh, Annex members, mm -hmm. which includes more than 30 countries, and it was very difficult to kind of find a mm -hmm. universal benchmark. We are talking here about all climatic zones of the world. Uh, what we only find an agreement on was that the United States, they are very good with having their own benchmarks. So they have a lot of database of benchmarks and even Canadians, for example, they use them. Uh, so this was an option to use American benchmarks that are developed uh, as part of United States Department of Energy uh, efforts with NREL and so on. Uh, recently, there was something in Europe, in the continent, meaning that we found this database, I forgot the name that has a name, Tabula, 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 mm -hmm. Tabula and another mm -hmm. database, it's called EP, which is a follow-up of Tabula, mm -hmm. I forgot its name. And there they did a good work because they mm -hmm. coupled the European EPPD uh, performance requirement because in the EPBD there was the cost optimality approach that requires that every member states has to have a reference building in order to calculate the cost optimality. So actually what did they do in Tabula, they collected, they invited member states to feed this database with the references buildings that were used in the regulation framework on a national level. So this was a second approach, the European one, but it was very diverse because it was depending on the country. And when we failed uh, having something common because we had Australians, we have uh, Chinese and so on. We said, okay, then we can go to the best test of ASHRI and this brings us back to our community IBIPSA because all these best tests are uh, uh, under IBIPSA developed mm -hmm. uh, with NREL. Uh, either people can select and then we said, do what you want, but either you take a shoebox approach using the IBIPSA shoeboxes <coughs> or you use your own national reference standard if you have one, if not take a regional one or a continental one. And we left it open and also we encouraged real cases. So if people have their own uh, monitored building and they have a benchmark that is monitored, uh, it's also welcome. So we said at the end, uh, the most important is to do a, this iterative approach of simulation mm -hmm. because we all learned that simulation, it's not about uh, what is the best weather file? What's the best reference? No, it's about collecting all these pieces of the puzzle, running the simulation several times, iterating and calibrating, doing sensitivity analysis, uncertainty analysis, and only then knowledge is created and only then we have a confidence in the outcome. So we, we, we encourage also, I encourage really any young uh, scientists who try to work with simulation, just mm -hmm. close the circle and go on, take whatever you find for the time being. And over time, through iteration, improve, replace. Once you get better data, put mm -hmm. it in the model, but the most important to go through the whole process and mm -hmm. try to uh, communicate the uncertainty or the range of error of your results. Because also we, we have a big problem with the weather files. We use the CORDIS, European uh, CORDIS uh, regional weather files. And now the IPCC published a new scenario, which is a worse mm -hmm. scenario. So what we did is already outdated. So we just said, we just keep developing and we try to have communication, communicating the range of error or the mm -hmm. uncertainty. And that's the only way so that future generation don't make jokes about us. Uh, we, we can never say that the confidence, it's, it will be always like, I don't know, 50% uh, plus confidence, but we cannot go beyond that uh, range in general. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Shady. Um, so I'm afraid we have to end the webinar promptly at two o'clock. So um, apologies to our audience if we weren't able to answer all of your questions. I can see some excellent questions uh, coming there. Uh, so I'm really sorry for this. Uh, if you would like, you're very welcome to contact either me or the speakers, and we hopefully can continue um, this conversation. So I would like to really thank our three fantastic speakers as well as everyone who contributed uh, to, to this webinar, supported um, the organization. 
So I think overall, I think there is consensus that in terms of improving the climate resilience of the built environment, uh, while COP26 and other initiatives and emerging methods are steps towards the right direction, a lot more work is needed to future proof our buildings and citizens and communities. Uh, so thank you again all so much for your contributions. So I'd like to invite a virtual round of applause and uh, hopefully see you at the next uh, EBIPS England webinar. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.